If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, hikers, campers, and outdoor enthusiasts, share your stories of scary and strange happenings in the woods, deep forests, and trails that made you never want to go back. I just want to share an experience I had about two years ago in the Sequoia National Forest. My sister took my friend and me out there, and we were deep in the forest, far away from civilization. We were having a great time. I'm a believer in the paranormal, Bigfoot, aliens, and all that stuff, but while I was there, I never had that thought. I was there camping with my family, having a great time. At about 9 o'clock, everyone decides to go to sleep, and my friend and I are left staring at the bonfire. I decided it was a good time to listen to music, so I went to my sister's forerunner, and I was opening the back to grab my iPod. And as I opened the back door, I heard something come out of the tree. It didn't come out of the tree. It was almost like it was holding on, and it fell. And I heard this huge thump. I could feel it. And as I, I had a flashlight on me. I looked over at the tree I heard the fall from, and I swear on my life, and I swear to God, honest to God, I saw a six to seven foot tall praying mantis. And as I laid eyes on it, I completely lost breath. I was completely taken aback. It took a step back, and it became completely invisible. I could not believe what I saw. I slammed the door, and I ran back to the campfire. I alerted my friend. I woke everyone up, and no one would believe me. I was really upset because I knew what I'd seen. So that happened, and my friend didn't believe me. He was laughing at me, and then all of a sudden I could hear all these things surrounding us, and finally, when I brought it to my friend's attention, he kind of put his ear to it, and he heard it too. Finally, I was patrolling the campground with my flashlight, and I could just hear these things surrounding us, and I heard like this clicking sound, it was like, makes clicking sound. It was really strange. I was so scared. I was solo camping and was on a hike to my favorite spot. I saw what looked like a man holding a massive rock in one hand and a knife in the other, facing me. This was pretty weird but other bushcrafters have been known to camp there too, so I gave the standard hey man. Shout and wave. I got a bit closer, and it looked like it was just a rock. I laughed it off and turned around, staring to walk away. A rock whizzed by my right ear, fast enough and big enough to really hurt me if it hit me. I turned around to see where the rock had come from, and the figure I'd seen wasn't there anymore. Yesterday, I was hiking with my friend in East Texas. He has indigenous blood in him, so he's very sensitive to spirits. Anyway, we were a mile and a half into this trail deep in the woods. It's Tuesday around noon, so this state park is empty. I start seeing shadows of animals, I'm assuming, first a white furry animal to my left, then a large black shadow, knee height, of what looked like a boar in front of me. I told my friend, and he said, oh, that's weird. We walk a couple more steps, he says he sees a person ahead, but there's no one there. We brush it off, whatever. Maybe our eyes are playing tricks on us. Then, all of a sudden, the air around us starts feeling super heavy and dark. Both of our chests start feeling tight, and there's pressure in the air. We both start hearing the voices of people chattering on the other side of the wall of trees to our left. I was assuming it was a campsite because this park has so many campsites everywhere. We turn the corner of the trees, and no one is there. We both looked at each other and said our own protective prayers, and we kind of booked it out of there as fast as we could. It felt like we stepped into a dark curtain or a portal of some sort, because when we passed a little river or creek, everything felt lighter and weight was lifted off our chests, and we had to stop to breathe and reassess what just happened. Has anything weird like this or similar happened to anyone while camping or hiking? 8-Year-Old Encounter in the Forest, Sweden This spring day in 1922 began as just any ordinary day in the life of the soon-to-be 8-year-old schoolboy, Usten Engström. He lived with his parents in the small village of Orsta, southwest of the Swedish city of Kolsva. After school, he joins his schoolmate Holger for a walk to Holger's home, where the boys play for a while. Then Usten started his journey home, about three Swedish kilometers. After having walked alone in this wooded area for some time, there is a peat moss to his right and the village school to the left. Usten is now close to home. But then something happened that would forever remain an unsolved mystery in the life of this young boy. Suddenly, lots of animals come running out of the woods, deer, hares, moose, foxes, badgers, and other animals. They run toward the peat moss. At the same time, the sky is darkened, and a strange light appears over the place. Ustin can now feel an acrid smell all around him. He looked up and noticed three grey objects hovering silently above him. They were so close, he could have thrown a stone at them. The objects were pulsating as if they were breathing, 
and I saw two dark lines on them. A bit further away, over the woods, another two objects were floating. They were bigger and darker than the ones above him. Then Ustin remembered nothing more. When he wakes up, he is lying on the road, freezing. It is now dark. No animals are in sight, but in the direction of Vaslanda Lake, he can see a pulsing light becoming smaller and smaller. Ustin is feeling very tired and starts walking the short distance to his home. The time is now 7.30 p.m., indicating a loss of four hours. He tries to explain what has happened to his parents, but they don't believe him. When Ustin didn't come home, they sent his older brother Gustav to look for him. He had traveled by bicycle to the school only to find out that Ustin had joined Holger at home. There, he is informed that Ustin left at around 3.30 p.m., so he returns home, passing the place where Ustin later woke up. As it was still daylight, Gustav should have found Ustin lying on the road. What happened to Ustin Engstrom during the four hours? This old and unusual close encounter case was first mentioned in the Swedish newspaper Expressen on June 15, 1996. UFO Sweden ufologists Klaus Svahn and Andreas Olsen contacted Engstrom, conducted several interviews, and visited the observation site together with the witness. I grew up north of Cincinnati, Ohio, in a town called Hamilton. When we were kids, we spent a lot of time in the woods around where we grew up. There are still some pretty big parks, but a lot of the woods are private property. A few of my older brothers had stories about creatures in some of these patches of wood. The first guy said he was out playing with a few friends in a decently sized patch of woods behind a regional airport. He was around 9 to 10 at the time. This would have been in the late 80s or early 90s. He said he was running and tripping on a rock or stump, and when he looked up, he saw a humanoid creature crouching behind a bush looking at him. I can't remember, but he said that it had yellow or green eyes and was covered in hair. He also said this thing had a bird face, and it never made a sound or moved. I just watched him and locked eyes for a few seconds before this guy got up and ran off. This creature, in our own little circle, became known as Owl Man. Used by us to scare each other in the woods growing up. We brought this up to this same guy, now in his 40s, and retold the story, which was dead serious. We've also heard stories from older guys that used to hunt in those same woods back in the 60s and 70s about seeing a Bigfoot type creature. I'm not sure if that's real or just a drunken story. Another story from another friend's older brother in the same area. He was on acid and didn't want to go home. So he went into a small patch of woods next to an old YMCA to take refuge in an old storm drain. He was trying to stay warm and eventually fell asleep. He woke up to someone saying, Hey, wake up. Hey man, wake up. He woke up to see a large beast with a tendril jaw coming out of the woods and into the storm drain. He ran off. He says he doesn't know if it was the acid or real, but either way, it scared the shit out of him. This would have happened in the 1990s. So these are the anecdotal stories of a few people who grew up around here, but there is also a video I found of some creepy sounds in the woods. It sounds like a hound dog, emo. I do own a hound, and I have heard her go off in the woods and sound nothing like this. I'm not completely sure. This happened to me in southwest Wisconsin as a preteen. One night, me and my friend sat on the sidewalk. Across from us was nothing but a river, forests, hills, swamp, etc. And in the middle of the night, we distinctly heard someone screaming for help out there. My friend thought maybe someone overturned their canoe or something happened, so we even called the police. They had to drive for about 30 minutes to our town. But when they got there, they went out there a little bit with a flashlight but said they didn't see anything. So for the hell of it, me, that friend, and another friend sat outside on the sidewalk again the next night to see if it would happen again. And it did. Except this time, it sounded like a blood-curdling scream. Something I'll never forget. This thing started coming toward us and got louder and louder until it sounded like it was right across the street, and we jumped up and took off, running back to my house. Whatever this was, it followed us. We could hear it screaming on the other side of the road while we were running. It was very foggy and dark that night, so we couldn't actually see anything within a couple of feet of us. We got home and told my mom about it the next morning, and she jokingly told us about the Irish banshee that forewarns people of a death. About a half a year later, my friend's brother, the friend who was there both nights, crashed his car into a telephone pole right across from where we were sitting, and then, for some strange reason, got out and finished walking to his dad's house in town and then shot himself in the head. I have never forgotten this experience. I also had several other strange paranormal experiences in that area of Wisconsin. I try to tell myself it was just an animal and a coincidence, but I will never forget how loud and terrifying this scream was and how it chased us. And considering the other paranormal experiences I had there, I'm open-minded about what it might have been. 
I live in upstate New York, and my town has a wooded area that's known to be haunted. We have something in there that all the locals call the werewolf. No one knows what it is, and bigger animals like wolves and bears don't actually live in the area, we just have deer and other smaller animals, but I and a few of my friends have experienced it before, and all our experiences have been practically the same. I don't think it's flesh and blood, but it's huge and darker than dark, as in, when it's pitch black outside, you can still see the outline of this thing. My last experience with it was two years ago. It was during the summer, and a friend and I decided to take a walk through the woods. We didn't leave early enough, though, and by the time the sun had set, we still had about a half mile walk out of the area. The closer we got to the tree line, though, noises started picking up. First, it was twigs breaking behind us, and then it sounded like a huge branch had been ripped off a tree and thrown. My friend and I stopped and turned around, and we saw what looked to be a massive black shadow move behind a tree. My friend screamed and took off, so I followed, of course. After running down the little embankment to the tree line, we stopped to catch our breath, and I turned on my phone flashlight so we could see properly. My friend opened her mouth to say something, but then twigs started snapping around us again. She grabbed my arm, and we both stopped breathing, probably out of fear. The snapping twig sounds kept getting closer and closer, so I shined the light into the trees. I saw, dead on, a black mass or shadow move to the right out of the light beam, and then we heard a low, guttural growl only a few feet behind us. We both screamed and started sprinting, finally getting out of the woods. We ran to her car and jumped in, slamming the doors shut and gasping for air. We looked behind us to see if anything was chasing us, but we didn't see anything, thankfully. That's it, really, but all the stories I know of people who have experienced the werewolf all say practically the same thing. It's a massive shadow that stalks you, you can hear or see it trailing you, it growls, and it chases you to the tree line, where it then seemingly backs off. Could it be a wolf or a bear? Sure, honestly. Of course it could. I've lived here my entire life, though, almost three decades, and my town has never once sighted a wolf or bear in the area, so who knows. I'm a bit more curious to know if anyone has stories of people who have disappeared under strange or even paranormal circumstances or have seen and or experienced strange things while in forest or jungle terrain that they are, at least almost, certain were not caused by humans. Couple of stories I've heard, just to get the ball rolling. While training in the military, a friend of mine and his unit were placed deep in the jungle, about a kilometer apart. They were told to make their way back to base camp, quite a few kilometers away, within a certain period of time, each armed with only a knife and a box of matches. He made his way up the river but hadn't been successful in trapping or catching any food besides the occasional grub for the first two to three days, and his spirits were dwindling. At some point, after yet another failed fish trapping attempt, he felt completely defeated and sat by the river, crying into his hands. A little while later, he heard a voice asking him what was wrong and turned to see a green-colored humanoid, maybe barely waist-high and almost amphibian-like, looking at him. He was rightfully freaked out but stayed put, and when the creature asked again, he told it he was hungry. The creature told him not to worry, that he'd managed to find food today, and soon waited and disappeared into the river. Sure enough, by that afternoon, he had managed to catch some decent-sized fish and finally enjoyed the best, and only, meal he had had in days. He managed to get back to base in time with no other incident, but he didn't tell the story to anyone for fear some would call him a wuss for breaking down and crying. Even he's not sure sometimes if it had been real, but I believe him, and I thank whatever that was for helping him out when he was ready to give up. Another involved a different friend, also in the military, his unit was made to conduct a solo camp, where they would be placed several kilometers apart and basically stand watch till the morning. One of the boys was quite a religious lad, and people here like to say that those who are tend to have their faiths tested. Sometime in the middle of the night, my friend and several of his comrades could hear someone reciting, or more like shouting, holy verses through the jungle. It continued for quite a while, but eventually stopped. In the morning, after they reconvened, the religious lad confessed that it was him, they figured. He was standing watch and sensed some movement in his peripheral view. After looking around frantically, he spotted, not too far from him, a human head with long hair on what looked like a stick, I imagine, like what you see on God, staring at him with a big smile. Which is when he started reciting the holy verses. Whatever it was stayed there for a while but eventually disappeared into the darkness, he was definitely one of the most relieved when the day broke. 3. A friend of mine who joined a program had to go through some physical training, including camping on an island you'd have to kayak to for about an hour or so. There would be two stops on your way there just for everyone to catch up, but you're basically crossing a large bay. Later that afternoon, they got ready for solo camp, 
and the instructors place the participants a few hundred meters apart, some by the beach, a few further into the jungle. They were given some matches, very basic supplies to cook some rice, and the orders to make a fire, a shelter of some sort if they wanted to, and to stay within a few meters of where they were placed. Most dozed off from the exhausting day after they set up camp, but my friend couldn't really sleep. He told me that at some point he saw a figure crossing the perimeter, he was sure it was a friend of his, another participant, and was about to call out her name until he remembered they were all under strict orders not to wander, surely if her friend were to be called back to base for whatever reason, there would be an instructor to escort her. He also realized, watching the figure, that he couldn't hear the noises one would make when walking on a forest floor full of twigs and dead leaves. So he kept to himself and basically stayed still, not even wanting to follow the movement with his eyes, though part of him wanted to. The next morning, after they'd all been brought back to base, his friend confirmed she stayed put the whole night. He wasn't so scared, as he was just weirded out, as he was so certain it was her. I'm not sure what would have happened had he approached the figure or called out his friend's name, but thankfully that didn't happen. There is an airsoft park my friends and I go to that we've been part of for a long time. It's about 180 acres, there are large hills and creek beds. It's a great place with a ton of trees and woods, however, at night, things get interesting. Here are a few different things we've been experiencing, and they have been getting worse or more frequent at night for the last few years. If any of you can point me in the right direction or give me some idea of what's happening and what can be done. We have people who play with night vision at night, and multiple people saw a large creature standing in the woods between trees, watching all these players as they were hanging out and taking a breather. They only saw it in the night vision and thought at first it was a deer because the head had antlers, but the eyes were not reflecting in the night vision. Upon further inspection, they saw it was not standing between trees but rather its arms as they came from its body, and it appeared more humanoid than a body. Multiple people saw it standing there watching them and kept trying to figure out exactly what it was passing around in the night vision until suddenly it was gone, no one could find it again, and the space was empty where it once was. At night, there is no sound, there are no crickets, no frogs, no owls, or anything. There's a large amount of wood and creeks nearly everywhere, but it's almost as if it were dead. Animals do live there, and they're commonly seen, but no one hears a sound as soon as it becomes night. I have only heard footsteps in the woods around me when I'm far away from anyone else. I have hunted deer, and I recognize the breaking of animal branches and that of something much bigger. The footsteps have been reported by others, and when people look, they never see anything, and they always seem to be going around them. Getting lost when we know the location with our eyes closed. For example, I was taking a group of players back up to the staging area because a couple of them were injured. It was a straight path back up, and somehow we were needed up on the other side of the property within a short period of time that almost felt impossible to get that far without any clue we were not where we thought we were. This also happened to a friend of mine who knows the paths way better than I do, and he got lost a shorter distance up and ended up in an off-limits area where they found the barrier was taken down as if it were never there at all, even though it was there not even five hours ago. There are more stories about people going missing for nearly an hour and never remembering not being with their friends, as if that hour never happened. We have a person who will show up and hang out with us at night who we think is a player, but he'll disappear, and we find out he isn't actually a player and never was there. We have also discovered that the area the field is in is where a large fight happened where many Native Americans died, and it is believed the hills we play on are actual Native American burial grounds, so we kind of just have a lot going on, and we are looking for an answer to these happenings and how to stop people from disappearing and being watched by shadow figures. When I was six years old, I lived in a small town in western Washington state. The city is very close to a forest area, and the population is mostly backwoods, country type. In the year 1998, I think, I was living in town. A night came when something strange and unique happened. My child mind couldn't fully grasp what was happening, but neither could the adults who witnessed this. My parents, my grandparents, my uncle, a police officer, and all of our neighbors witnessed a large number of floating or flying green balls of light. They were around softball size, maybe a little bigger. My mother has reminisced about the night and told me about how they chased my grandmother's car up the street and would pace the local traffic. A family friend admitted to seeing them on the nearby highway that night. My family has a very religious background, so their thoughts were that this was sinister and evil, but my memories are different. I vividly remember the green balls connecting in lines of five or so and spinning around like a baton and then unlinking to fly freely again. They would hover just above the street, up around the street lights, and just everywhere in between. My mother kept ushering my brother and me inside out of fear, but I was not afraid. This may have been because I was young and unconditioned, but the lights didn't seem dangerous to me. 
there must have been at least 100 of them. I have theories about them, but I've never been able to find any other encounters, so this is my newest attempt. I've even put up local flyers with my email to try and get anonymous stories. People in that area just don't like to talk about this stuff. To the credit of my religious family, they did seem to cause the lights to leave. I remember the last time I saw them was when my grandmother was praying and telling them to leave. They suddenly stopped, and all at once they shot up into the sky and disappeared forever. I have wanted to see them again ever since. I'm 27 now, and I'm still left wondering what they were. My main theory is extraterrestrial. My mother supplements this because she remembers seeing a large craft with spinning lights on it in the sky. I have actually dreamt of this as an adult. Anyway, please, if you or anyone you know has seen these lights or anything like this, I would find a lot of peace in just knowing that my little hometown is not alone. I've got a spine-chilling tale to share with you. It's an experience that still haunts me to this day. I can't say for sure what happened in that cabin, but I can promise you this, it was the most terrifying encounter of my life. A few months ago, I embarked on a solo hiking trip deep into the heart of the wilderness. I was an avid adventurer, seeking solace in nature's embrace. As the sun began its descent, casting long shadows over the towering trees, I realized I had underestimated the journey ahead. Nightfall was imminent, and I had no choice but to find shelter. Luck seemed to be on my side when I stumbled upon a cabin hidden among the dense forest. It was an old, weathered structure that seemed to have been forgotten by time itself. Its windows were cracked, and the front door creaked ominously as I pushed it open. Inside, the air was musty and filled with the scent of decay. A layer of dust covered everything, hinting at years of abandonment. Despite the eerie atmosphere, I convinced myself that spending the night there would be better than braving the dangers of the wilderness in the dark. As the hours passed, strange noises echoed through the cabin's corridors. Whispers seemed to emanate from the walls, and the floorboards groaned as if burdened by unseen forces. I dismissed it as my imagination running wild, trying to rationalize the situation. But then, a painting on the wall caught my attention. It depicted a family, a man, a woman, and a little girl, all with wide smiles and eyes that seemed to follow me wherever I went. Their presence sent shivers down my spine. Something was off about them, something unsettling. Attempting to shake off my unease, I ventured further into the cabin, exploring the rooms one by one. In the back, I discovered a small study. On the desk, a journal lay open, its pages filled with faded ink. As I leafed through its entries, my heart sank. The author, a man who had sought refuge in the cabin just like me, chronicled his descent into madness. He described the whispers that plagued his mind and the hallucinations that tormented him day and night. The journal ended abruptly, leaving me with more questions than answers. Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to spend one more night in the cabin. Sleep eluded me as the whispers grew louder, the voices intertwining with my thoughts. I couldn't discern reality from delusion, and the boundary between them blurred. By morning, I was a mere shell of my former self. The faces in the painting had twisted into grotesque contortions, leering at me with malice. Shadows danced menacingly, mocking my feeble attempts to escape. The cabin had become a prison, and I was trapped within its walls. With the last ounce of my strength, I fled from that unholy place, not daring to look back. As I emerged from the forest, I glanced over my shoulder, expecting to see the dilapidated cabin, but it was gone. It vanished without a trace, as if it had never existed. I have since tried to uncover the history of that cursed place, but my efforts have been in vain. It seems the cabin was but a mere whisper in the annals of time, a forgotten nightmare etched into the fabric of the forest. I am a biologist, and one of the perks of the job is being able to see some remote and spectacular places that people don't see very often. Part of my work involves collecting insects from remote waterholes out in the middle of Australia, a few hundred kilometers north of Uluru. One of the ladies I work with, Alice, lives out there full-time and spends a lot of time out bush and with the local Aboriginal people, so she has a trove of stories and weird experiences. But I'll just tell you about the one I had. So, as I said, I visit a lot of waterholes out there. Being in a very arid region, these waterholes hold great spiritual and cultural significance for the indigenous people. Most, if not all, of them are sacred in some way, and they all have traditional stories attached to them. So, one day, Four of us headed out to this particular site for a full day of heavy four-wheel driving through the Fink Gorge. We get there not long before sundown, and as we pull up, there is a black dingo standing in the spot we are going to camp. He stares at us for a bit, then disappears off into the bush, as they do. This in itself isn't weird. There are plenty of dingoes out there, and they come in a range of colors. It is not that common to see a black one, 
but they are around. So that's fine. We set up camp and had a nice night of looking for pythons and drinking wine, yep, biologists. After that, we went to sleep in swags. It was really windy that night, so that drowned out the potential for quiet, spooky noises, and I went to sleep pretty quickly. That night I had a really vivid dream about the black dingo coming into camp, sniffing around my swag and scratching at the netting, trying to get in. It bothered me, and I woke up but went back to sleep pretty soon after. Still, not so weird. We woke up in the morning, did our sampling, packed up camp, and started off on the long drive back to town. After we have been driving for a bit, Alice starts talking about how seeing the black dingo at the campsite when we got there really freaked her out. She didn't say anything earlier because she didn't want us to be spooked. It turns out that in traditional folklore, that waterhole is protected by a black dingo spirit. The last time Alice camped there with other people, one of them had a dream that a black dingo came up to their swag and started attacking her. This lady woke up with long, deep scratches all over her face and no reasonable explanation for them. I had no idea of this story before I had the dream and didn't mention it to anyone that morning. There is definitely a special feeling to the Aussie outback. It is very hard to describe. Then the landscape feels desolate but full of spirits and history. Two of my friends and I used to be stationed at FT. Bliss in El Paso, Texas, and we decided a Memorial Day camping weekend would be a good idea, so we took a trip up to Monjo Peak outside of Rio Dosa, New Mexico. We planned to stay for three nights, the first two of which were very relaxing. On our first day there, when we were deciding where to set up our tent, we found loads of bones from various animals, not mounted up or anything like they were collected, just bones all around the campsite. The campsite had five places to pitch tents over about 300 square meters. We decided to pitch our tents on the highest point at the campsite, about 30 to 40 feet higher than the parking lot shown on the map. On the third night, it was well after sunset when all the noise from the woods died out. I'm not sure how long it was silent before me and my friends broached the subject, but it wasn't long after that that the hair on the back of my neck started to stand, followed by goosebumps all over. I could see my friends starting to get jittery, and from one of the other campsites, we heard their two dogs going absolutely apeshit. These were very relaxed and happy dogs for the last two days. We had also made decent acquaintances with the couple who had the dogs, and they had lunch with us on day two. The other two groups that were camping at the same time had gone silent as well. The car was about 60 meters from our campsite, and we unanimously decided to go get our guns, our 15s and 9mm pistols. On our way back, we started to smell a rotting, fetid stench. I don't know if anyone has ever had to burn feces before, but it smelled like that mixed with death. It was cloying and felt like it was almost physical, it was so strong. We got back to our campsite and decided to post guard all through the night. One man up and two asleep, or at least resting. I volunteered for the first shift because I knew I wasn't getting any rest at all. We had plenty of firewood for the night, especially because we were leaving the next morning. I kept the fire blazing as much as I could because I figured that if it was some sort of animal, it wouldn't be too interested in messing with me. I kept my back to the fire so I could maintain good night vision. As you can see on the maps, the forest to the southwest of our campsite was pretty burned out, but what you can't see very well is the elevation change. Once you got into the tree line, it was very steep, not impassable by any means, but not somewhere you need to be walking at night. Behind the trees, I noticed a stark white shape. I shouldered my rifle, and it didn't move at all, I assumed it was a partially hidden tree behind another one. I started scanning the tree line with a flashlight because I felt the stench was stronger than it was before. As my beam passed over what I thought was the obscured tree, I saw an eye shine from the white shape, and as soon as I registered what I was seeing, it disappeared behind the tree. I debated investigating but instead just roused my friends, and we scanned together. When my shift ended, I took off my rain fly from my tent so I could see out if needed. I didn't see anything on my next shift, just the smell. In the morning, just before dawn broke, the smell seemed to recede, but only so much, almost like it left a scent as a warning, was the impression that I got. We broke camp and started packing up, about halfway through our breakdown, we saw the other three groups packing up as well. I went over and talked to the couple with the dogs, asking them if they saw anything last night or if their dogs calmed down after the barking stopped. They told me that even when they stopped barking, the dogs didn't sleep. They spent the night whining and growling in the direction of the hill to the southwest. I have spent more time camping than probably anyone my age, 29. It is more than a hobby for me, it is an essential recharge, at the very least. Anyway, I have had so many strange experiences that it is hard for me to speak about any one in particular detail. Most of the time, it is a feeling. You can be set up somewhere for three days. For two days, 
everything has been nice and relaxing, but then on that third day, a feeling might wash over you, similar to the feeling that you are being watched but with more depth. A feeling you can't shake, no matter how hard you try. This usually happens around dusk, which is only compounded once the sun goes down and visibility is at a minimum. I digress. Here are a few stories from my most recent trip away. The first and probably strangest experience on this trip happened one night when we camped along the Darling River at an unspecified camp spot not far from Burke and Will's campgrounds, just downstream of Menindee Lakes. My partner and I arrived fairly late into the afternoon, as we had just done a solid day of driving to get there. As soon as we arrived, we took the esky off the ute, rolled out the swag, and got started on the fire. After a bit of dinner, we were just sitting around the fire talking when, all of a sudden, we heard a big splash in the river directly in front of our camp. Keep in mind we are camped on the bank, so the water level is probably 3 meters below us but only about 3 meters from our fire too. We immediately had our torches on the water, scanning to see what may have made the splash, but we couldn't find anything. Only the ripples in the water. Now, for reference, I am not a big guy, but the size of the splash sounded like someone or something quite a bit larger than me is what made it. This kept happening periodically throughout the night. Each time it happened, we scanned the area again with our torches, without finding the source. To this day, we have no idea what it may have been. The only large-ish animals we saw out there were goats and emu. None of which would have made the noises we heard in the Darling that night. The second notable experience of this trip happened a few days after the last one I mentioned. We had traveled up the Great Alpine Way from Bright, through Mount Hotham, Omeo, and well into the Alpine National Park. I had heard of a nice campground that had quite a challenging 4x4 track to get down into, so our plan was to head straight there and set up for the night. We managed to find the trail, and once we started down it, we were committed. I was honestly not certain we would have been able to get out had we stayed the night, as we were out there by ourselves on a Monday afternoon with not a soul around for probably 100 kilometers in any direction, and there was rain coming, which would have turned the exit track into a slip and slide. Anyway, we successfully made it down the track and into the campground, which was beautiful. There was evidence that it was used by locals who liked to party, but that didn't bother us, as we had the place to ourselves. Because I was worried about being able to make it back out on the track, I got out of the ute to let some more air out of the tires before we headed any deeper into this part of the forest. As soon as I exited the car, I felt like a thick blanket of air had somehow wrapped itself around me, and I couldn't escape it. I felt like I was both being watched in a predatory way and being squeezed by something I couldn't see. This had me pretty rattled, and I am not someone this happens to easily, so I ignored it and put on a brave face for my partner, who I could see was also feeling supremely uncomfortable. We didn't discuss it, but I had a look at the map and found another campsite about an hour further into the forest, and I decided that we had to tackle the exit track before it started raining. All I knew was that this was the last place on earth I wanted to get stuck for a few days. I have felt an eerie feeling in the bush before, but never like this. My partner immediately agreed with me, and we got back in the ute and drove the duck out of there. Once we reached our campground, which had no bad energy, we both began speaking about the feelings we had at that first sight. We couldn't explain it but we both felt the same thing. The closest feeling we can liken it to is the feeling of being hunted. We both knew there was something watching us, and that something only had bad intentions. I grew up in northern NSW, and there are plenty of strange stories that have come out of the Pilliga out between Narrabri and Kunibarabran. Strange portals and reality rifts in the wilderness. Not my stories heard from the people and friends around me, but I'll share them here with you guys. Forests and wild places have always managed to draw to them the eeriest and, often, most fantastical stories. These are places that typically hide beyond the human eye, existing out there in their own worlds mostly unimpeded, and wildernesses have long had legends, myths, and bizarre tales pervading them. Here we will look at cases of people coming across what seem to be strange portals out in the forest, as well as what might be tears in reality itself. 1. Montana, shared with me by a friend who says that in his younger years he and his family lived in a valley he describes as a place the local Indian tribes had a lot of reverence for, and furthermore, the river that meandered through nearby was traditionally used by these tribes for vision quests. It already certainly sounds like an intriguing place, but one day it would apparently get even more so on an otherwise calm, clear day as he and his sister took a walk through the forest. The area they passed through is described as being an island at a fork in the river, covered in thick trees, and one of their favorite places to explore, a place they had been to many times in the past. On this day, things would change. Here it is from the witness's point of view. This particular day, however, was somewhat different. The weather was perfectly beautiful, with golden sunshine filtering through the trees. 
We were calmly walking through the woods when I felt what I can only describe as a figurative tug in the center of my chest. It felt like a fishing line was hooked into my heart, and I had little choice but to walk in the direction I felt it was leading. At this time in my life, I was far more open to spiritual and supernatural experiences, so I know I was far more likely to believe what I was feeling. My sister noticed the change in my focus and behavior and asked if I was okay. It was as if I could not speak or think, I only followed this feeling in my chest. My sister knew something was up and followed along. I kept following this feeling, this tug, into the cottonwoods, where the trees were closer together. The feeling was so odd, I felt completely captivated. I did not want to feel or follow anything else. As we went further along, I felt that whatever this was was leading towards an opening between two trees that had grown and arched together over a dry stream bed. I know, typically, a natural doorway. As I walked closer, this feeling of joy, awe, and just happiness grew and grew. As my sister and I stepped through the trees into this dry creek bed clearing, the tug stopped. Instead, it was as if the light itself became more real. Golden and rich, as if you could now touch and feel it. Outside noise faded away, I felt as if time had stopped. It was the same forest, but completely not the same. As she and I are standing there, silent and soaking this in, I see something black, two feet tall, dash across the clearing. Either this thing came from behind one tree and disappeared behind another, but I'll be damned if it didn't look like it came from under one tree and, dove under another. Either way, I only got the quickest look. But I had never seen anything like it in these woods before, or after, for that matter. Shortly after this, both my sister and I noticed that this feeling and this change in the world around us faded away. In a few seconds, it was clear we were standing in the same forest as before, nothing different from the last hundred times we had walked there. We walked home in silence, as we both felt something profound. 2. Another case, someone who says this happened at a state park in Arkansas during a camping trip with his family in the summer of 2014 as a part of celebrating his graduation from high school. I went about 15 or so minutes in, and that's where things got funky. Every wood has some type of sound going on, whether it's water flowing, bugs chirping, animals moving, or wind howling. But things went dead silent. And I mean, just completely quiet. The hairs on me stood up, and I decided to cut a shortcut to the path where I thought my family would be on the trail by then. I started walking fast towards them, and my shoe was loose. I bent down to tie my shoe real quick and then looked back up, and the lighting had completely changed from daylight to darkness. It was around 5 to 6 p.m. when all this happened, and 8.30 on my watch when I came back to reality, and the normal sounds of the woods were back. I sprinted back to the stream and followed it back up the trail, sprinted down the trail, and into the park station, I tried calling them on my phone, but there wasn't service in the woods. I saw them talking to a park ranger, and my mom was in tears. Long story short, they were mad. I didn't tell them because I didn't want them to think I was crazy and make up the fact that I got lost. They told me they tried looking for me after I was gone for a while and then came to file a report when they couldn't find me. 3. Another one told me the witness had a surreal and very frightening experience in the woods when he was 8 years old on a family camping trip. He says that he was out with his older brother, 11 at the time, and that they were out on one particular trail right next to the campground that went around a small lake in a perfect circle, with no offshoots or branching trails, which they went out along to go fishing. On the other side of the campground was what he calls a wilderness trail that they had never used and which was off limits. On this day, they went out fishing as they had many times already, but this time things would unfold into a strange and scary incident. The witness says. The lake was in a deep gully with high ridge lines that surrounded it, so going off the trail was nearly impossible. It was small, and our parents allowed us to use the trail to go fishing, which we had done all week. The wilderness trail was about 100 yards away from the entrance of our loop and on the opposite side of the campground. So, we went fishing, and after taking this same trip many times before it started getting dark, we headed back to the campground. We ended up getting lost, we never went off the trail, for the remainder of the night, and at first light, we appeared at the entrance of the wilderness trail, 100 yards away. Our parents were flipped out, the entire county had been searching for us, and neither of us remembered anything other than walking up to the trailhead in the near dark. But we had lost time because, to us, it never got completely 100% dark at all and felt like dusk the entire time we were lost trying to find our way back. It only felt like a couple hours. It was dawn when we were found. We estimated that we were gone for 10 to 11 hours or so. My brother claims to remember some details, like falling down a cliff, running from someone, or something literally dragging me as he ran through cobwebs, etc. Ever since, he said bad dreams of bright lights in the woods, a cave, shivering, rushing loud water, engine sounds, 
etc. I haven't had any memories from it. We were camping at Deem Wilderness area, and there is a well-known cave a few miles away. We recently went back to the area to go fishing together and decided to take a look around where we were at the campground almost 30 years later. We then realized it would have been nearly impossible for us to end up on the other trail, as the cliffs and ravines were just too high. There was too much distance between the two trails, and we would have had to make it through impossible odds to end up back at the entrance to the opposite trail, waking in thick, untouched forest. What are these strange little excursions off the beaten path, and what could they mean? What might we be dealing with here? Are these little rifts or tears within the fabric of reality itself, popping up in these wild places to draw people in, only to blink back out of existence again? Where do they lead, and what happens when one does not return from them? Could phenomena such as these possibly be behind the numerous missing people who have seemingly vanished into thin air within the wilderness? There is really no way to know, but reports like this continue to come up of something very unusual happening out in the forests away from civilization. Whatever such cases may represent, they certainly put a strange spin on the outdoors and may be something to keep an eye out for the next time you are taking a scenic, quiet hike. I don't know if I wasn't supposed to see what I did. About six months ago, I went into the forest with my friend. We walked through the pitch black darkness until we reached some steps that took us down to this clearing. At the bottom of the steps is a stream that cuts through two big rocks. On the right is brush surrounding a 5-10 foot deep tiny lake, maybe 30 feet big in each direction. As we approached the edge of the stairs, we walked down. When we reached almost 60% of the way, we both saw a blue light obscured by the brush. My first thought was that it might have been the headlight of a fisherman with one of those pulsing blue headlamp lights. That was until we saw it pulse and literally go through a tree, like literally phase through it as if it weren't there. I told my friend to turn off his flashlight so whatever it was couldn't see us. My brain was trying to process what I was seeing due to the fact that nobody should be or can't get into the forest at night. It slowly kept moving from the right side behind the brush to the left. As it got closer to the edge of the tiny lake where the rocks were, my body's fight or flight kicked in, anticipating that it was a person who wanted trouble. Then it happened. I saw it disappear and reappear on a path on top of the water, clear from the brush. I wiped my eyes, and my friend, stunned, looked at me and said, what? I shook my head and tried to refocus my eyes. Whatever this was, it was only 10 feet away from me. It was a blue orb about the size of a softball. The color was the most beautiful blue, or baby blue. It looked see-through and like a full ball of light at the same time. As it kept on its path, it would slowly pulse. One bright pulse, then it would vanish slowly. We both stood there watching it for at least one minute when I decided to leave. I didn't want whatever it was to get close to us. I didn't and couldn't believe what I was seeing, and I didn't know what kind of consequences would come from getting too close. A side note I forgot to mention was that there was this background sound that seemed to be connected to whatever it was. It sounded like a loud all-around gust of wind mixed with that sound you get before a tornado touches down. Finally, we got halfway up the stairs and turned around to watch it from a safe distance, maybe 20 feet away. My friend got the bright idea to whistle at the orb without consulting me. Almost immediately, the orb started pulsing as it was but changing its trajectory towards us on the stairs. We let it get maybe 10 feet away from us when I grabbed my friend and pulled him away to leave with me. I told him it's better off not finding out what it is or can do. We made our way up and out of the forest and left. About a week later, I told my stepbrother about it, and he didn't believe me, so we went back. We did the same trip through and saw nothing. Right at the end, before we exited the forest, there was another just like it. This one was weird though, I don't know why, but it almost seemed lost. There was no purpose to its movements, it was just going anywhere but in a straight line. So I live in a rural area that in the past used to be farmland, but since it has been reclaimed by the forest, there is very dense undergrowth such as thorns and vines and a lot of stuff to trip over. Anyway, there's a trail that I walk every day multiple times, as I like to smoke back there. This trail is the only clear path through the woods. It leads in for about 150 feet and then stops at a dead end. This was my favorite spot. I still walk it today and have for 4 years. Usually I wake up and go straight to my trail before I'm even fully awake. So one day last summer, it's 11am because, typical teenager, I'm half awake and walking the trail. I'm almost at the end when I hear the underbrush rustling with the sound of something bipedal moving fast. So naturally, I'm like, what the hell? and I'm looking for the source of the sound when I see 4 years. Usually I wake up and go straight to my trail before I'm even fully awake. So one day last summer, it's 11am because, typical teenager, I'm half awake and walking the trail. I'm almost at the end when I hear the underbrush rustling with the sound of something bipedal moving fast. 
So naturally, I'm like, what the hell, and I'm looking for the source of the sound when I see, about 20 feet away from me, past the end of the trail, a large black figure taking off from me. Now I stand an even 6 feet tall, and whatever this was was probably just as tall or taller than me. Once I realized what was going on, I took off, running back to my house. Now I realize that it was most likely a person who got caught where they weren't supposed to be, but it's fun to think that I could have encountered a Bigfoot in my own backyard, and ever since this happened, I've always been paranoid that someone or something was watching me in those woods. It makes me extremely hyper aware, and I feel like those woods aren't mine anymore. Also, if it was a person, what the hell were they doing? Sneaking through the woods so close to my house and then sprinting away when they're caught. Back in 2006, my then girlfriend bugged me for months to go camp on the Appalachian Trail, since we lived relatively close by. We had to drive a bit to get there, and, indeed, the sun was close to going down by the time we arrived. We pulled into the parking lot at the trailhead and began to unload. It made us nervous that there was a man just sitting in his car in the parking lot. The engine was running, but he wasn't doing anything, he was just sitting there. We kind of took our time, hoping that he would drive off, because it made us nervous that a guy was sitting there watching two girls hike off into the woods. More unnerving was that, with the sun going down, we wouldn't get far enough from the parking lot to feel safe. We tried to outweigh the man, but he continued to sit there with his engine running, doing nothing. Losing daylight, we couldn't wait anymore and headed onto the trail with the dogs. We hiked for a bit, apparently not far from a highway, as we could hear traffic the entire time. Right around the time when we'd have to stop due to darkness, we passed a shelter with three or four people camping and cooking dinner. They were young and friendly, there was at least one girl in the mix. We said hello in passing and hiked on another few hundred yards, where a campsite appeared just a ways off the trail. We kept walking, but wound up losing the trail because it was getting too dark to make it out. Jen wanted to keep going, but I was most scared about losing the light before finding wood and getting set up, so I put my foot down, and we doubled back to the vacant campsite. At the very least, we were within screaming distance of the other campers, should anything happen. I set up the tent, and Jen began to search around for firewood. It was odd because we lived in a nearby area and it hadn't rained recently, but everything on the forest floor was wet, wood and kindling included. We then went into panic mode when we realized we might not get a fire started. The sun was fading fast. Fortunately, I'd brought a roll of toilet paper, so Jen set about trying to start a fire with that and I frantically crashed through the woods, searching the bases of trees for the driest wood possible. All of the wood was so wet that Jen was struggling to keep even the smallest pieces burning for any length of time. We switched places, and I began to baby that fire as best I could, but it was difficult. It just wouldn't catch. After a while of crashing around in the dark woods, our headlamp began to die, and then our flashlight as well. We then realized that we hadn't thought to put in new batteries. After a great deal of sweat and tears, we managed to get the fire going and eventually built up enough to boil water. We then ate our food. Once we cleaned up, we settled in front of the fire with our wine and chilled out. Everything around us was peaceful, and the dogs were fast asleep. We let the fire die down and headed into the tent, where there were some intimate shenanigans, and then we went to sleep. At about 3 a.m., I woke up for no reason, like no noise or anything, but Jen was awake and quietly freaking out next to me. When she saw that I was awake, she whispered that she was scared and to just listen, so I did. First, I heard the sound of the highway in the distance, then night insects. But then, I heard two very weird things that put me on edge. The first was the sound of thick branches snapping in the woods close by, but there was no other rustling, like I would associate with deer or even bears. By the sound and loudness of the snaps, these were large branches, like three plus in diameter, so whatever was breaking them had to be large. But why couldn't we hear any movement through the brush and leaves? It was all quiet, and then. Snap. As I lay there, feeling increasingly freaked out and vulnerable in the tent, I began to notice another noise. They would come one at a time, but it sounded like rocks being dropped through the trees. Just like a decent chunk of rock falling from the top of a tree, going thunk, thunk, thunk as it hit branches on the way down. I'm a scientist, a skeptic, and usually quite a logical person, but I have to say that I was really freaked out. I tried to reason with myself and said, oh, you're being silly and scaring yourself. It's acorns. Of course. Just acorns. Acorns, just acorns. It also was a consolation that the dogs were outside and not barking, but honestly, with as weird as it felt and with all the weird noises coming from all directions around our campsite, I have no idea how the dogs weren't bothered by it. We spent an uneasy hour listening to these noises, and because we were a bit afraid that the guy in the parking lot might have had bad intentions and followed us in, 
we finally just felt too vulnerable in the tent. We were able to get the fire started again by stoking the embers, and we sat up drinking the remainder of our wine to calm our nerves until the sun came up. The next day, trying to make the previous night less scary, I looked all around the campsite for acorns. I couldn't believe it, but there were none. None of the trees around were oak trees, but they were some sort of evergreen. I didn't find pine cones, either. Honestly, I really wanted a non-creepy explanation, and I couldn't find anything that would explain what I heard all night long. We both agreed that we felt like we'd experienced some weird Blair Witch shit and quickly packed up and booked it out of there the next morning. We talked about it on the entire trip back, how scary and weird it felt, but neither of us could figure out how such large branches could get snapped all around us without any other sign of movement. What the hell was falling through the trees if it wasn't acorns or pine cones? Just to make the whole thing creepier, we googled the part of the Appalachian Trail where we camped and discovered that there had been two sets of grisly murders, ten years apart. The women murdered were lesbian couples camping, as were Jen and I. The first murders were in 1986, the next in 1996, and the year Jen and I went camping in that area was 2006. My husband's grandmother lives in a quiet village, maybe 15 to 20 minutes away by car from the nearest town. Most of the people who live in her village have family plots and orchards, and for the most part, their houses are built just by the main, single lane, road, with thick jungle behind and between, as well as a rather hilly topography. I'd rather not disclose our location, but I will say it is in Southeast Asia. About two three months ago, as my husband and I left his grandmother's house after visiting, came around 2 to 3 p.m., left around 9 p.m., we passed by a car parked by the side of the road, as well as a police car and fire truck, but thought nothing much of it. The next day, when we came to visit, there were an astounding number of cars parked just where the police were the night before, including the military. It turns out a man had gone missing the day before, a 72-year-old retired school teacher who bought a plot of land only accessible by walking through some shrubbery and crossing a river via a wooden bridge. He had apparently gone to the plot earlier in the day to clear out weeds and whatnot with two of his foreign employees, according to them, as they were getting ready to leave, he asked them to go ahead without him as he wanted to walk around the area. Hours later, as darkness fell, he still had not shown up, which is when the employees finally sought help. The employees were detained for a while for questioning as they were the last to see him, but from my understanding, they were released as they were not believed to be involved with their employer's disappearance. Search parties were conducted day and night, every day, by his relatives, friends, villagers, volunteers, the police, and the military for a month, but there haven't been any concrete leads, mostly rumors and speculation. To ease the telling of the story a little, I'll be referring to my in-laws as my own, so grandma instead of my husband's grandmother, and so on. I'll also be referring to the missing man as John, as I'd rather not disclose his real name out of respect for his family. John had bought a plot of land a few months prior, some way down the road, fruit season can be very lucrative as well as a great time for family bonding around here, so it's not uncommon for people to sell orchards and plots of land and enjoy a great payday. The plot of land where John went missing was sold by a different person. I've never met this man, but grandma knows him as most of the area belongs to them and their siblings, there are nine aunts and uncles, which is pretty normal around here. The plot of shrubbery through which one would walk to get to John's land also belongs to an aunt and is immediately next to a compound on which an uncle and auntie's families both have houses. From there, you would have to go downhill and cross the river I mentioned earlier. Most of the rumors I've heard come from grandma and two uncles who have assisted in the search efforts, one used to work in the forestry department and the other was in the military, all grew up with the jungle as their backyard. One of the most prevalent rumors here was that he was taken or hidden by a rang halus, a term most people in this region use to refer to wood sprites, certain jinn, spirits from nature, or generally the unseen, though it is distinct from hantu, which is used more to describe ghosts and the plethora of scarier creatures. They are known to be similar to humans in most forms, including the physical, down to having families, villages, intentions, and religions. These houses and villages usually just look like trees to most people, but to those they choose to show them to, they look like their regular counterparts. They differ in that, besides being undetectable by most humans, time also passes slowly for them, most would say a day spent in their realm is equal to three days in our time. They also tend to live quite long lives and may sometimes make friends or even have relations with humans, though those stories are far and few between. It isn't completely uncommon, however, to meet people who are a bit more sensitive to the other realm and can see, hear, or just feel their presence. I myself know quite a few people, including a nephew who accidentally freaks people out quite a lot by pointing out what he sees. Most get used to it and accept it as part of them, some would prefer it if they didn't have the gift at all. In some cases, 
When people enter these areas, they suddenly become befuddled and are not able to find their way out, but they do not tend to experience seeing anything paranormal. This nearly happened to one of the military units during one of the night searches, but thankfully they managed to find their way out. In other cases, they may encounter a human-like figure or what they believe is another human, and after engaging with them, they come home to find they were presumed missing by friends and family. Usually, for the latter, the missing are found in good health and in clean clothing, certainly not like they were missing and fighting to survive. In both cases, the missing tend to believe they were not away for long but, in actuality, were gone for much longer. There have also been cases where the missing could see and hear the search party but could not be seen or heard by the search party. According to an uncle, the K-9 unit was brought in during the initial search, and the dogs ended up by a dead tree not too far from the starting point, so large you couldn't wrap your arms halfway around the trunk, and kept walking around and scratching at it. This was the weirdest thing to hear for me. Although quite a few people have speculated that John had perhaps fallen into the river while making his way out, some of the stories I've heard make me somewhat doubt that. When explaining what happened, the two employees made it seem like John had noticed or seen something interesting around the area and had asked them to go ahead without him as he wanted to check out the vicinity, supposedly his words, translated. Interestingly enough, this was when Grandma told me one of the local ladies had had a first-hand account some time prior, whereby she was foraging in the jungle and happened upon a great village where she was pretty certain there had always been trees, complete with houses and a place of worship. I assumed she just got out of there as fast as she could. Grandma also told me about her grandfather, they've lived there for generations, who was familiar and could interact with the Orang Halus who lived in the area. During the few weeks after John's disappearance, news had spread quite widely, and a number of people had shown up and volunteered their services to the family. John's family was quite well off, and it seemed some people were looking for the piece of fame, money, and or glory that would come with the success of finding John. From what I heard, most of them would go about it quite aggressively, sprinkling holy water and salt and demanding John be returned. Others had dreams and visions, such as that John was taken away by an Orang Halus who had seen and taken a liking to him, or that he decided to take one as his wife and decided to stay in that realm, presumably his real wife was not keen on hearing this. There were also rumors that John tended to carry a lot of money on his person and that his employees basically killed him and put on a show. As far as I know, nothing came out of any of these rumors, and now, a few months later, most efforts have pretty much ceased, although we would still occasionally see John's kids parked by the road, if only to sit, wait, and pray at the camp that was set up earlier. Grandma thinks they went about it the wrong way and that if the Orang Halus did take him away, they might actually be keeping him out of spite now, due to all the commotion and disrespect they've been getting. She said her grandfather would always tell his kin to treat the Orang Halus with respect, to speak and interact kindly, and not be aggressive, basically, how you should treat another human being. I think he's right in that respect, there's still quite a lot in the world humans know little about, and our arrogance certainly doesn't help. Wherever John is, I wish him and his family peace. I live in the Midwest. I live on a small, rural lot between a cornfield and a small forest, in a camper. I've lived in this county my entire life. I know the entire county like the back of my hand. This being said, I've come to the conclusion that my experiences in the rural and wooded parts of this county are crawlers. I'm 100% sure of it. I've had many encounters, actually. None back to back, but they happen frequently. There is a forest or park in the middle of the town that I have always hated at night since I was little. As I got older, my cousin and I thought getting scared was really fun. We'd go there at night on purpose, but it never lasted long. I always felt like I was being watched. This, on top of urban legends of people going missing here at night, made me feel really uneasy. Fast forward to a few years ago, when I got married and am now settling into life as a husband. I would take my large, all-black German Shepherd, Fenrir, on walks with me at night. I always walk towards the park, but I usually don't enter it. The first time something weird happened was five years ago. I was walking Fenrir, and the woods to the front and to the right of me, to the left and behind me were a neighborhood edge and a small playground, went silent. My dog started acting super anxious, he's usually a very stoic and quiet dog. He's 120 pounds and built like a tank, he looks very intimidating, and he knows it. I heard rustling in the woods following me, and I felt like I was being stalked. I ran home, and that's the end of the first encounter. I had a few more encounters like that. But last year, things really accelerated. I was on a walk around 11.30 p.m. with Fenrir, my wife, and our little newer dog, Booger. He's a terrier chi mix. We are walking down the same path, and about three blocks away from the woods, four or so deer are sprinting out of the trees into the street, towards us, and they seem terrified. 
Then I hear what I can only describe as what sounds like a human trying to mimic the sounds of a monkey. I thought it was silly until recently. When I read that other guy's story, I heard the same ducking thing. We laughed it off as some kids played around. Once we get up to the woods and are walking parallel, we can clearly see two reflective eyes and a silhout staring us down from the tree line. We also heard a deep growl and then, like, a hissing sound. But it wasn't super high-pitched or anything. Both our dogs acknowledged this as well, Finn stared, and Booger growled a bit. I made a Facebook post in the community Facebook group, and other people told similar stories around town. Around this time, I got a job as a tour guide and maintenance technician for Rail Explorers. I am working there again this year as well, we start on April 1st. Basically, they take unused or tour-specific railroad sections that aren't used federally, and they have these pedal carts with motor assist on them that you can use to explore the tracks, it's super cool and super fun. The one I work at is like 5 minutes from where I live, and it goes through the woods in an inaccessible part of the county unless you float down the river and hike up steep, loose dirt hills. You go under one old car bridge, and you go over two multi-hundred foot long old train bridges. The first one is larger and taller, and it's about 150 feet off the ground above the forest. The second goes over the river. I'm about six months into the job, and it's fall. We work until midnight sometimes, with the last tour leaving around 9 p.m. That means the last tour for the last two months of the year is in complete darkness. The way that job operates is with six employees. Four get on the lead bike, and two get on the rear bike. From the lead bike, we drop off one person at the busy intersection so they can flag traffic, and one person gets dropped off at the large train bridge that goes over the woods. The person at the bridge gives a short safety speech to the customers who stop and go one at a time over the bridge. The employee carts are much faster than the customer ones. We all have walkie-talkies, and we usually have these battery-powered floodlights on stands we use so the customers can see us. And light up safety vests. On one particular night, we were behind by 20 or so minutes. Instead of leaving the depot at sunset, we were leaving at dusk. I was stationed at the high bridge. By the time we reached the bridge, it was pitch black, aside from the stars providing a little light. My co-workers dropped me off and waited with me until the first customer arrived. I gave the little speech to that first group of four, and I chatted with them a little bit. I was trying to take some time and wait for the next customer cart so there wasn't a massive gap for my co-workers who have to flip the bikes around. After a few minutes, I let these customers leave, and I was alone. I was alone for 20 minutes. I used the radio so many times, but it was static for everybody. It's one of the only times we've ever had an issue like that as well. I kept seeing movement in the tree line. I kept hearing fast footsteps all around me in every direction. I had the floodlight on above my head, so everyone and everything could see me, but I couldn't see shit I turned off the floodlight and used my personal flashlight. I kept seeing quick glimpses of pale skin moving quickly, but right when I started seeing stuff, I could hear the next customer cart coming close, so I turned the light back on and waited for them to come around the corner. When they pulled up, I noticed they had a little boy with them, and he's scared of the dark. I'm terrified at this point but have to act appropriately, even more so because of this boy. I do not want to scare him. As I'm finishing my speech, I hear movement right behind me and say, Jesus ducking Christ, and I spin around with my flashlight on instinct. Poor kid. I told them it was probably just a deer, and they were good to go across the bridge. That same night, the person stationed at the intersection, this isn't like an in-town intersection, it's very rural. It's right next to a massive cornfield. He was Native American and was very in tune with his culture. He told me privately a few weeks later that he heard rustling in the cornfield, and whatever was out there was whispering his name and trying to get him into the field. He was also without communication for those 20 minutes, but he wasn't in the woods and could see a lot better than me. Another time, me and that same co-worker were headed back to the front cart. We were way ahead, so we stopped the cart in the middle of the high bridge. It sounds scary, I am a bit afraid of heights, and this bridge has massive gaps between the planks you could fit through. But after doing it so often, you get used to it, it was a clear night, and we were watching the stars and having small talk. Then it goes silent. We are a hundred and so feet in the air above the woods, we can hear for miles. The dogs barking across the river for two miles can be heard without even seeing the houses. We hear what sounds like a human mimicking a monkey noise and we hear growling. He looks at me completely seriously and tells me, in a stern tone, that we need to get out of here right now. I drove TF out of there, and he moved states to Nevada shortly after this. A few other things happened here and there and to co-workers as well. Each of my co-workers has at least one story. I'm only sharing mine here. A few months go by, and it's late fall, around the middle of November. 
I drive through that park in town a lot when I just want to go for a drive. I had my dog Fenrir with me, and it's around 2 a.m. I can't sleep, so I'm listening to Melvin's CD and driving leisurely through the park. As soon as I get past the entrance gates, I feel really uneasy and weird. I'm not easily scared. Going to that park at night makes me feel a primal fear, it's beyond fight or flight. I have never felt that way in my life anywhere else. Ever. And I feel it every time I'm there. I'm driving through the park, and I've rolled the windows up a lot more. Fenrir can still poke his head out, but he can't leap out. As I go deeper into the woods, I feel worse and worse. I decided not to turn around because I'm already past the halfway point, turning around would make me stay in the woods longer. I started speeding where there weren't turns, I couldn't see around. I rounded the last corner, and what I saw made me have nightmares for months. There was a pale, skinny humanoid. Tall and lanky, not quite human. It was crawling on its hands and feet, but it was crawling fast as duck. 20 miles per hour type shit. We don't have bears here. The only animals that are that size are large humans and deer. That wasn't a deer. It went from my right, crossed the street, and went into the tree line. Fenrir saw it too, he doesn't bark at animals. Not even other dogs. He went ballistic, he was trying to force himself out of the small gap in the window, nearly foaming at the mouth and snarling. He never, ever acts like that. I'm a certified dog trainer, and I've raised him from birth. Most recently, I've become obsessed with this park. I've walked there at night from my camper to the park with Fenrir. I'll never do it again. I didn't see a figure this time. As I was entering the park, a massive owl flew by my head so close I could have smacked it mid-flight. This made me feel weird for some reason. As soon as I get into the park, I feel extremely weird, anxious, and nauseous. I walk a few hundred yards to the only streetlight in the entire park, and I turn around and face the woods. Me and Fenrir stood there, frozen, for like 10 minutes. The silence was deafening. Anytime I heard anything, I jumped. Finn was anxious as hell too, he kept staring into a certain spot in the woods a ways off. I swear I saw eyes in there every once in a while. I built up the courage to walk out, and I haven't gone back since. I wanted to add that the county I live in is packed full of abandoned mines. There are hundreds of them.